Good afternoon, everybody. I think we'll make a start now. I'm sure others will be joining. Uh, a very, very warm uh, December afternoon. Welcome to you all. Uh, this will be Carbo's last public event of the year, and it's on a topic of immense importance. This is the second one that we've had this year on climate change, and it's an issue I'm glad to say that is attracting ever greater attention, uh, especially in, in the Middle East, the impact that it'll have on this area of the world. And of course, we had COP26 in, in Glasgow. So this fantastic panel will uh, look at how uh, this will pan out for the countries of the region, the environmental challenges they are faced, which are very extreme, desertification, extreme heat, rising sea levels, dust storms, uh, and many other issues as well. And how does this hydrocarbon rich area of the world transition itself away to cleaner alternatives? What are the positive way forwards? And can we look at some examples, particularly, for example, in Jordan, which Shada Al Sharif will uh, be talking to us about? So it's a great pleasure to, to welcome our speakers. And first up uh, is uh, Gleda Lan. Now, she is uh, a research fellow at Chatham House. You have her biography. She's worked on a range of international resource related projects uh, and her research interests include petroleum sector governance, Asian foreign resource investment, access to energy in developing countries, sustainable transitions in oil and gas exporting economies, Arctic extractive policies, the pricing and valuation of natural resources and transboundary water issues in the Middle East and Asia. Uh, she's extremely well qualified to introduce the topic for us today. We'll then move on to uh, Manal Shahabi and Shadar Al Sharif. Glada, over to you. Thank you very much for, for joining us. Give us that sense then of what the major challenges that the Middle East are going to face and you know whether you think that after COP26, things look a little bit brighter in terms of how they may be dealt with. Well, thanks very much, Chris, and I'm really happy to be here. And I mean, I think it's just telling the number of invitations that I've had, and I'm sure Shada and Manala are the same, to, to talk about issues of environmental change and climate change in the Middle East and North Africa region, you know, over the last, year or two, this issue's really risen up the agenda. And there are a number of reasons for that, uh, given that it was, it's been pretty low on the list of historical priorities for, uh, for governments and, and arguably for populations in the region. Um, I'm going to run through uh, a few slides, as, as uh, Chris said, to kind of sh share with you the way that climate change is, is affecting countries in the region and is projected to affect countries in the region over the coming decades. Um, we've been working on a project called Cascades with a number of European partners looking at climate impacts in different parts of the world, including the MENA region, and how the, uh, and, and, and how the compound risks might actually uh, impact on Europe and how uh, Europe the EU and European countries can work with partners in the region to build more resilience. So that's um, what I'm going to draw on today. Uh, oops. It's not looking to the next slide. Hold on. I don't know why. Okay, let's try this one. Great. Okay, so first of all, there's the question of heat. So everybody, when people talk about climate change, they, they talk about the, the temperature, the average temperature rise and, and in terms of two degrees, three degrees, you know, the, the aim of 1.5. But whether it's 1.5 or 1.8 or two mean very, very different things at the local level. And it, it tends to mean extremes. It tends to mean, you know, a higher number of very hot days. And we've already seen this happening. Um, across across the region this summer we saw record temperatures six at least six countries um, hit over 50 degrees Celsius last summer which is incredibly damaging to to human health to 
animal health to plant health, you know, if, if uh, exposure is prolonged. You've also got a rise in humidity levels, and people have been talking a lot about this wet bulb temperature, the point at which the human body can't cope. And if you see the red dots on that map on the right, that's when it's reaching very, very close to that, uh, to that fatal level in, in the Gulf region. So let's have a think about water as well. This is a projection of, um, of, of the stress on water in, by 2040. And we should think, by the way, that there's a certain amount of warming that's already locked into the system because of cumulative emissions. So we are on a pathway to at least the mid 2040s now in terms of the average temperature rises. And beyond that, of course, keeping within the 1.5 target would make a radical difference to, uh, to regions like, well, regions everywhere, but particularly the Middle East for certain reasons. Um, but this much is, is probably locked in. And as you see, you know, this ranges between a, a, an increase of 1.4 times more stressed to 2.8 times more stressed across the region. You know, is that really a problem? People in the region are used to dealing with aridity and, and, uh, and you know, scarce water resources. Well, yes, it is because this is how the map looks now with many regions already highly stressed or extremely stressed in the region where the data is available. And, you know, it's not just, it's not just a case of evaporation that's a problem. It's also depleting groundwater um, overstressed rivers that have been overexploited through through damming and through pollution for agriculture. And you're seeing some of those facts certainly play out with the agricultural and water crisis in Iraq at the moment. Um, you're also seeing increasing floods, storm, the, 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 the frequency and intensity of tropical storms has increased. Um, so over the last couple of decades, we've seen several uh, really catastrophic storms coming across the Indian Ocean and hitting Oman and hitting Yemen. I mean, it's useful to point out that those two countries have very different levels of resilience, um, Oman being a wealthier country than Yemen, Yemen being mined in conflict, already having suffered conflict damage. And I think it's, it's a it's a good point at which to stop and think about vulnerability factors and resilience factors in terms of how we understand climate change. I mean, this is true across the world. You know, if you've got um, if you've got a climate strategy, if you've got stability, if you've got um, active civil society, effective infrastructure, um, and um, and general economic well-being, then you're going to be a much better place to deal with with climate change consequences. Um, in the Middle East and North Africa region, environment, environmental issues generally have tended to be overshadowed by many security and political factors. There's a lot of war damage um, and humanitarian crisis from military conflict across Syria, Iraq, um, Libya, Yemen, um, Gaza, that's come over the last decade, you've got worsening conditions um, in, in the Palestinian areas from the Israeli occupation, and you've got a breakdown of the economy in Lebanon. You've also got diplomatic tensions amongst the Gulf states, and all these things tend to override environment and climate change as priorities for, for regions, for governments, for, for populations. Um, across the region, you've also got 15 million or so displaced, either refugees or internally displaced people, living in often highly vulnerable conditions, which makes them more exposed to weather extremes. And then on top of that, you've got the human rights um, and rule of law question, which people don't always um, put together with climate change or don't ever or always see through that lens, but it's incredibly important and incredibly critical for the state of resilience. We did, we conducted a lot of interviews with experts and 
and, uh, and workshops as well on this issue and the amount of times that the role of civil society, the role of greater decentralization was pointed out um, as critical in terms of resilience was really striking um, because of course, you know, local government and civil society will essentially be first responders to uh, disasters and to um, slow onset events as well. So there's another type of climate related risk, um, which Chris has already referred to, sometimes called transition risk. And this is also critical for several countries in the region who are highly dependent on oil and gas exports. We know the markets for these commodities are changing. This is from the IEA's net zero by 2050 report, which tries to give some kind of projection of the, uh, the room left for, uh, for fossil fuels in the global economy if we are to, to meet our, the, the targets of the Paris Agreement. And this chart uh, from the report just shows how the OPEC and non-OPEC shares might work out. So it might be that OPEC still maintains a very large share of the market. And yet you can see the market as a whole declining, which would mean that the price also declines. And there's a great variation in countries' abilities to weather that and in their wealth and level of dependence. So I, I thought it was worth just grabbing some numbers from the World Bank to show the uh, GDP per capita numbers, which are shown by the size of those bubbles. So for instance, you've got Qatar at uh, over $85,000 per person sort of per, per capita GDP and you've got Iraq at, at just over 9,000 so you can see that there's a very vulnerable group of countries here Algeria, Libya, Iraq um, which would be extremely sensitive to, to price change um, but you've got others you know the, the Gulf states which are uh, used to a much higher standard of living so it could also you know changes in that uh, revenue could also be politically disrupted. <clears throat> so I just wanted to end with uh, a few thoughts about how climate change and environmental degradation, and I kind of want to put them together because they're so they're so critical to each other. If you have, you know, if you've managed your resources well, you have a thriving ecosystem, then it will be much more robust to dealing with climate change impacts. So I just wanted to, to think about how how these issues in, intersect with politics and, and maybe the different lenses through which climate change is seen at the local level, which in the end will be key to pushing it up political agendas and, and enabling it to be taken seriously. So in 2018, uh, around August, September, you, you had this, this horrendous water poisoning crisis in Basra. Iraq, um, and about 118,000 people were hospitalized and it led to um, huge and violent protests. Now, there was a combination of reasons that led to that contamination and climate change would only be one factor. Um, there would be poor transboundary water relations, for instance, between Turkey, Syria and Iraq and Iran. Um, there would be uh, issues of poor water management, um, corruption, um, pollution, and um, but but the the linkage between uh, the frustrations that were building anyway um, around unemployment and uh, the inequality in the region really were brought to a head by this uh, poisoning incident, and you can easily imagine that to happen um, in many other sort of climate related. Uh, crises. We've already seen, you know, food food uh, price spikes, for instance, uh, spark riots in Egypt and other places in North Africa that led to the Arab Spring. So um, I thought that's just something to to land on, and just to say that, it, you know, there is a. It's often been it's often been thought considered, you know, in in discussions on politics or oil or. Um, all of the many things that people have focused on in the Middle East, that environment is not uh, a priority. But I think that is 
changing very rapidly at the local level. It's just often seen through a different lens. So it's seen, as in here, through the lens of unemployment and inequality and you know, lack of access to resources, or it's seen through the lens of occupational tactics um, actually inhibiting the ability of farmers to adapt, or it's seen through the lens of humanitarian crisis and you know, in, inability to supply energy or water. Um, so, or, or through diversification that I think Manal will touch on for the countries that are, are at risk of, of uh, uh, revenue decline. So I will finish there. I think COP26, just to say, I think COP26 really has signaled a turning point. Um, it's probably the COP where Middle East governments were the most engaged, um, not only from the governmental levels, but also from civil society level to uh, where they were able. And uh, there are now some opportunities for access to finance and for um, some partnerships on resilience, which I think certain countries are very keen to obtain. Um, and, uh, and so it's not, I painted a pretty gloomy picture, but I think that uh, we will hear, anyway, we'll hear from Shada and Manal who might actually brighten that a little and show some of the opportunities that we have going forward. Thank you very much, Gleda. That's um, a terrific introduction to uh, the discussion. And um, I'm sure that, you know, that will trigger many questions, which as ever, if you could put them in, in the chat, that would be wonderful. We, uh, we now turn to, to develop uh, these ideas to uh, Dr. Manal Shahabi. Now she's an applied economist, a senior research fellow at the Oxford Institute uh, for Energy Studies, visiting academic at St. Anthony's College, Oxford, research associate at the Economic Research Forum, and she's the founder and director of Shared Research and Advisory. And uh, she speaks so many languages, it's uh, uh, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, you know, Chinese as, as well as Arabic, French, and I list them all. Um, but uh, Manal, it'd be great to hear from you, and particularly also you know, on that question of energy. Um, you know, how are these countries that are so dependent on oil and gas um, really going to make this transition. And we we heard, you know, some of the, uh, you know, aims and targets coming out of COP26, particularly with the regard of countries like Saudi Arabia. Do you think that's enough? Uh, you know, uh, is it being taken seriously enough yet? Over to you. Thank you very much, Chris. And it's good to be with you today and to be with everyone. Uh, I uh, think these are very important questions that you ask, and I've put together some slides to kind of help make the, the discussion a little bit easier for uh, those who are following us. So I'll be um, sharing my slides now. Um, and in the, um, what I wanna talk about really mostly is pretty much the question that you asked Chris is particularly company or countries that are dependent on um, oil and gas. Uh, but I wanted to kind of largen the, the discussion and not call it just hydrocarbons, but really more the energy transition in general and the trajectory of that going uh, forward. And to kind of set the scene, I really want to build up on the excellent introduction that uh, Gleda had given us, uh, so I will try not to repeat any of her points. Um, but I, uh, I think it, it kind of helps to just set this scene a little bit in terms of uh, what happened at COP that actually is helping uh, or affecting um, hydrocarbon exporting economy and the energy scene in the Middle East in general. Um, as was mentioned, there's the um, UAE, Saudi Arabia, and Bahrain making uh, net zero emission pledges uh, by around mid-century. Uh, of course, particularly with Saudi Arabia's Green Deal, there's the uh, nature-based solutions with planting uh, 10 billion and 40 billion trees in Saudi and uh, the region, respectively. Um, also on response measures, which is the part that I was involved in while attending COP, was also um, some uh, efforts that would be helping, particularly uh, when it comes to economic diversification, the different countries in the region. Uh, there's been doubling of climate finance, but not all the initial commitments that were the pledges that were made by advanced economies. So all of those will really help 
shape whether what will be happening in the uh, Middle East will be sufficient or not. And all eyes are on the region. Uh, the region itself is, you know, taking this uh, a little bit more seriously, of course, um, uh, particularly as we look into the next uh, two cops being in Egypt and in uh, the Emirates. Uh, but what I want to focus on is really what is the trajectory in the MENA with, with the climate and basically answering your question, Chris, are these the work is going to be enough? Um, of course, with, even if everything is perfect in uh, the Middle East, we need to remember that the external environment with the you know, rising temperatures and uh, effects of climate change uh, mitigation and response measures will continue to also impact uh, the climate and economic and energy trajectory of the Middle East. So I don't want to really talk much about that. I think a lot of that Blada had covered. I want to talk more on what the, uh, the countries are doing uh, domestically. And the first point I wanted to talk about briefly is why this is important, particularly for hydrocarbon exporters, oil and gas exporters, because they overdepend, and I mean overdepend as in more than 90% in some cases, of uh, budget, uh, government budget and export revenue on exports of oil and gas. Uh, and along with that, they have fiscal and energy and environmental challenges. Um, there is also, uh, where is the, um, here we go, we see the laser. All right. And there is this uh, graph here that I pointed also from uh, the IEA, which builds on uh, basically the message of this is the uh, going decline of fossil fuel share of the energy mix going forward, which basically means that this will continue to affect uh, negatively the fiscal outcome. Put of or, or the fiscal position of the Gulf states, which has already been really constrained, particularly after COVID. Um, and if we look at that also from an oil importing country's perspective, um, they also have concerns because as Leda mentioned, they are they don't have the fiscal space that is as, um, as strong as oil exporters. They also um, uh, have uh, uh, economic diversification needs. Um, and then at the same time, they worry about energy security. So um, the all these projects that are domestically happening in the region for purposes of the climate can then also affect these fiscal and economic uh, vulnerabilities that the nation, the countries have. Second point is, what about existing energy transition opportunities that, is, that, have, that, that's, that are taking place and where, wh what is really motivating them? I won't talk about this much now, and I'm happy to address them more in details in the Q&A, but there's been wide announcements, wide initiatives on renewable energy, uh, on nuclear power, particularly in the UAE and potentially considered elsewhere in the region. Uh, of course, talk about carbon uh, trading and carbon markets. Uh, CCUS, which is a carbon capture, utilization and storage technologies to use to reduce basically the carbon output and find a solution for the carbon, emis carbon emissions of fossil fuel uses um, through the system or the framework as referred to a circular carbon economy and also uh, hydrogen which is uh, not just hydrogen but also new potential new uh, um, uh, energy uh, uh, sources that could also drive economic value. And I want to mention particularly hydrogen a little bit because it's been looked at uh, as a hype in uh, the uh, recently as a potential source for both energy solutions and also energy security needs. Um, and in the past, uh, most of the hydrogen that's been produced has been using oil and gas as uh, or, or coal as well. But in the region, uh, in the Middle East, it's mostly oil and gas. Um, and now if we incorporate carbon uh, and sequestration technology, then it could be clean. Uh, but also, if we use renewable energy, then it can also become really clean because there is the hydrogen itself doesn't produce any emissions, but the input to produce it through a renewable energy wouldn't also create emissions. And what this has meant that it's not only oil exporting economies that are now looking to diversify and adopt strategies, but it's also allowed traditionally oil importing economies to start considering becoming energy exporters. And we see that particularly with Morocco and, and Egypt. So this is kind of the tradition or the, 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 the uh, initiatives that are taking over in terms of what will be, um, uh, whether we can achieve climate targets in the future in the region. Now we move into the third part of the um, talk, which here we go. Um, is, and this is where I actually have a lot more points, but it's more or less the same amount of time, is are these targets then achievable or not? What are the tensions in the region and what are the challenges? And um, there are quite a few. And the first one is, um, 
I think particularly, for example, when we when I just explained to you the hydrogen solution, a lot of that is really focused on uh, kind of incorporating that of the di economic diversification plans of the region and uh, meeting the uh, economic needs and not so much really driven by environmental focus. Um, and we see that with the second challenge was really the fact that renewables continue to remain very slow in the region. Um, and um, as a matter of fact, oil exporting economies, even though they have economic means, they're behind oil importing um, uh, Middle East uh, uh, countries where we see more advancements on uh, renewable energy. Uh, Bahrain, for example, oh, actually all of the, the states, this data is a bit a couple of years old uh, but basically um at the moment all the regions in the gulf with the exception of uae have less than one percent of their renewable of their total energy coming from renewables uh, uae was about two percent now this year i believe it's up to seven percent but if you compare that with their targets these targets range anywhere from 15 all the way to 50 percent so we are really far away from targets and these are these targets aren't new these Predate COP. So the question then becomes what's going to happen now differently that will drive advancements in these um, uh, targets? Um, the, set, the third uh, uh, kind of challenge is that we continue to have uh, ongoing um, high consumption, and uh, this is consumption, particularly in oil uh, in oil uh, dependent economies, has been driven largely historically by the welfare state, by very high subsidies, very energy, very well generous subsidies. Um, and if uh, I, we look at the uh, rise in domestic consumption, it's a lot faster than the rise of uh, um, uh, demand is in blue is a lot faster than growing faster than production, which is in uh, in uh, in orange. But also the emissions for these tend to also be high and the emissions uh, come mostly from energy sources, including electricity and water desalination also transport, which basically means that individual uses is really important in this, driving a lot of this, a lot more than industry. And if we look at this at a per capita level, we also see that the region, it's not really Arab countries that have an, a high average, sorry, that's my alarm. Um, it's not really the high, the middle, the, the Arab countries that have a high um, uh, consumption, it's really the oil exporting economies that have a high consumption per uh, capita, and that also leads immediately to high emissions per capita. In fact, uh, oil producing countries of the Gulf have the highest or among the highest emissions per capita globally. So if we have energy transition projects that are driven mostly to meet export demand and not the main source of emissions, it leaves us questioning whether we are really doing enough at a local decarbonization uh, level to meet climate uh, targets and reduce emissions. And this takes me to the next challenge, which is the fact that for us to meet uh, a lot of the, the energy transition projects at the moment in the Gulf, because of the high dependence on um, oil and gas, uh, depend on the uh, combining that with carbon uh, capture utilization and storage technologies. Uh, but also, this will also be important for um, you know Morocco and Egypt and any other country that wants to expand its energy export uh, because it's very uh, technology dependent. And the region has very little uh, advancements and very little uh, expenditures on R&D and technology. So we're a bit behind, which means that we will, excuse me, there will be need for finding solutions to tar to address uh, this uh, um, shortage. Um, and this is also leads also then to the other challenge is if we're investing all of these amounts, all of this money that's going to go into these energy transition projects, is it going to be commercially and economically profitable, particularly given the, the high price for um, uh, carbon at the moment and the fact that a lot of the CCUS technologies are not very viable at the current market uh, uh, dynamics and the lack of um, uh, no carbon uh, tax, for example. Um, and then that will immediately lead to ongoing fiscal constraints, uh, particularly because in, in the Middle East, we see um, largely the state is what drives investments in energy transition projects. Um, and then also, it's going to be uh, a challenge because there's a really weak uh, regulatory uh, framework when it comes to matters relating to decarbonization, uh, to uh, CCUS technologies, and also to the environment. So there is um, that will have to be significantly improved if we were to meet any of the climate targets in the region. 
And now I want to uh, talk about the last two challenges. Uh, the first one really um, addresses the point that Gleda had mentioned that there are um, weak uh, economic resilience in the region, and I think the the, the region wouldn't be uh, would be much better suited to meet climate change uh, uh, challenges if we have better economic uh, resilience. And at the moment, one of the uh, main problems that I found from my research um, that really weakens and uh, causes significant loss of economic efficiency is the private sector structure and the fact that the private sector in all of these countries, particularly with state in the Gulf region, tends to be very oligopolistic. Just reforming that will significantly improve, without doing anything else, will significantly improve the economic resiliency of these nations to make them more prepared to meet climate change mitigations. And the final challenge also is the fact that there are uh, significant water challenges, not only from um, um, the existing, the, the pressure of um, that is already existing on, on, on water, uh, but also the fact that a lot of these energy transition projects require a lot of water, uh, also require significant desalination, which means more brine, for example, that will be re-added um, or added, I should say, to existing water uh, um, uh, resources, particularly in the Gulf. Uh, but also, um, these have ongoing health and fiscal and economic effects. And we see, um, I particularly mentioned the, uh, the, uh, the Nile Delta here as well, because this is potentially a particular uh, situation because it also is really a source for economic and agricultural uh, products. So we have the, the pressure that comes from um, uh, the cl climate change itself, but also the pressure of ongoing climate uh, energy transition projects on these um, uh, water resources. And what does that mean with increased salinity and increased acidity in all parts of the region? And, and the region um, as uh, you know, we're really water poor, um, um, probably one of the poorest regions in the world when it comes to water uh, across all of the different countries. So what does this all of it mean? Well, there are really five takeaways that I want everyone to take out of this. The fact that energy transition projects that are uh, uh, focusing on climate sustainability are also important for economic and fiscal uh, uh, purposes in the region. Uh, the second one is there, we have large opportunities, but they're really still driven mostly by economics and not so much by the environment. And because of the challenges I've showed you, the, the path ongoing is really bumpy and quite difficult uh, and is not really going to be particularly in Gulf economies. It's not an alternative for the need to export, uh, to diversify the export base. And um, finally, um, I think we are not doing enough in the current uh, uh, policy regime. I think there is still ongoing need for uh, fiscal, microeconomic, and uh, regulatory reforms. So, uh, and definitely the culture of the, how we perceive the environment in the Middle East to combine that with the uh, uh, plans that the region has. And on that, I will say thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions you have afterwards. Thank you very much, Manal. That was um fascinating and um, we are now going to move on to talk about uh, Jordan um, and its challenges uh, with uh, uh, Shada Al Sharif. Now Shada is uh, speaking to us today from Amman. She's an advocate for climate action, green economic transition and sustainable development in Jordan. Um, she's spoken widely on, on, on such issues uh, you have uh, your CV and she's got uh, likewise some slides. And I think, as, as you all know, Jordan uh, is uh, one of the countries with the greatest scarcity of water. It has many of the challenges that have been discussed about a great deal. And indeed, you know, Carby arranged for a briefing to members of parliament and, and the Lords with uh, King Abdullah recently before COP26. Mm -hmm. And you could certainly, you know, I think, uh, those who attended and heard him were impressed by the level of concern that he showed on this issue. So, Shada, what is going on in Jordan? I think that uh, there are some uh, things to be quite cheerful about and, and positive mm -hmm. about some of the, the changes we've seen there. Absolutely. Um, thank you so much, Chris and, and Kabu, for this invitation. It's wonderful to be amongst uh, these distinguished uh, ladies speaking on these issues today. And just what you mentioned on the House of Parliament being involved, that's exactly the kind of positive change we're seeing in Jordan is that, you know, Parliament is, is getting engaged on these issues. And so I hope that, you know, I can run you guys through uh, some slides, maybe help us end a little bit on a positive note for the future. Um, 
you know, this is just for me to share with you that uh, with the audience, actually, that, you know, I've worn the hat as a consultant in the private sector, but of late, I've been really focusing on, on shifting the policy direction in Jordan, uh, really leveraging sort of the green and climate uh, transition. So that's kind of what I've been up to for the last few years with the last hat I've been wearing uh, as an advisor to the Ministry of Planning and International Cooperation. But I'd also wanted you guys to take away from this is that I'm a mom of two. And that's really the main driver for what I do is, you know, trying to keep honest about the work we do uh, as environmental and climate advocates as well. So, of course, the doom and gloom picture, I think you all got very clearly uh, later shared a lot of the numbers. Uh, but, you know, just to capture it very quickly uh, from a regional perspective, really, uh, and Jordan is really part of this region, um, you know, heat uh, is increasing. Uh, the precipitation is decreasing. Um, you know, the impact on shared water resources, be it the Delta or the Jordan River, um, and then the, just the you know frequency of extreme weather events, uh, be it floods. Really, the, the flood that we had in Jordan a few years ago was a wake up call, uh, and I think helped in a way uh, to bring this issue uh, higher up in the national agenda. Uh, but when we look at okay, what does this all mean really for for lives and livelihoods in Jordan? We're talking about agriculture being particularly hit, and this really affecting the productivity and food security in the region. As you, as Manal mentioned, what, uh, you know the region is among the most water stressed in the world, uh, and we're talking about 80 to 100 million people uh, really severely impacted by water stress by 2025. If investments in water resilience are not made in the next few years, and then we're talking about health and well-being of people, uh, you know, with rising temperatures, more vector-borne diseases and waterborne diseases, and it is a region, of course, that has uh, an, an, you know, comparatively high percentage of vulnerable populations, refugees. Uh, so imagine all of that compounded with climate change. But I'm supposed to be the one that giving you guys a positive outlook. So I'm going to stop at that with all the uh, sort of scary projections. Uh, but suffice to say that Jordan in 2017, before it was particularly fashionable and before sort of the hype around COP26, uh, issued a national green growth plan. And there was this recognition that uh, green can be a driver for development. And, and with this plan, you know, there was an identification that, okay, Jordan's vision 20 2025, which came out uh, even before uh, climate change was, was you know, uh, high up in the agenda, um, there was an argument that this green growth plan can help Jordan achieve 10 of its key uh, desired outcomes for uh, economic prosperity. So things like uh, increasing workforce participation, uh, particularly for women, uh, you know, addressing our poverty and inclusion issues, um, helping small and medium sized enterprises, uh, resource security, uh, as we keep hearing about this issue, and, you know, strengthening our infrastructure. So there was already that linkage being made uh, even back in 2017. And, you know, this plan comes in to try and really address five key objectives, you know, economic growth being one of them, of course, but then, you know, social development, inclusivity, uh, you know, this is one of the plans that had a lot on, uh, you know, gender inclusivity, people with disabilities and engaging them in developing this plan, uh, but also looking at resilience. Resilience is a big thing that, you know, all of us uh, have come to appreciate the importance of resilience to shocks like uh, COVID and climate. Uh, biodiversity was one of the main objectives uh, of that plan but of course also greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, important to note that more than half of the measures in this green growth plan were targeted at climate action. And uh, it looked at six key economic sectors. Um, and so I wanted you to know that this linkage between uh, you know, uh, green and climate and economic development was somehow made in Jordan a few years back, but I think today uh, is being taken a bit more seriously. So I think people that somehow thought that this was a nice to have plan back then are really seeing its relevance uh, today. So uh, if you were to look at an example in the region where you have kind of a vibrant, pretty advanced climate and green economy framework, uh, I would definitely invite the audience to really look at the case of Jordan, as I mentioned, the Green Growth Plan. After that, you know, last year, just in the middle of COP, you know, the Minister of Environment over Zoom announced that we would have six sectoral action plans so that, you know, you have a clear pipeline of projects in those six sectors uh, that I mentioned to you. As, of course, as you can imagine, you know, water, energy, transport, tourism, waste, um, you know, and these are 86 actions totaling together 1.8 billion. So that on its own is an invitation uh, to, to the investment community. Uh, these aren't projects that the Jordanian government can implement on its own. So, um, you know, the pipeline is there. Um, Jordan was one of the first countries in the region to issue a climate change policy. And as we speak now, uh, an updated policy is going to be um, submitted to the Council of Ministers for adoption before the end of 
of the year. Uh, Jordan issued its national adaptation plan, one of the few countries in the region to do so. Uh, it issued its updated NDCs or nationally determined contributions before COP. Um, it raised its ambition. You know, Jordan is not an oil exporter. It's certainly uh, actually dependent on, on importing energy. Uh, but, it, it, you know, Jordan... As a small country, of course, climate change adaptation is the priority, but still in good faith, raised its ambition uh, from 14% to 31% uh, greenhouse gas reductions by, by 2030. Uh, and then at a price tag of 7.5 billion was articulated, but with a caveat that you know 26% of that target is dependent on international assistance. So again, that's the clear invitation uh, from the country for you know uh, investments, grants uh, in, in climate uh, actions. Um, the Ministry of Planning does look at Jordan's progress on SDG. So we mustn't forget that that's still also an, an, an agenda that's alive in a country like Jordan. And how can we bridge that climate agenda with the SDG agenda? Uh, and of course, uh, sustainable consumption and production, uh, a plan on that was actually also issued. So I think some people might you know, um, accuse Jordan of having too many plans and too many strategies. And I wouldn't disagree too strongly with that statement. I think there is a need to consolidate a lot of these uh, frameworks, but this at least tells you that there's interest and that there is um, an, an effort to study this issue from you know, all sorts of different sectoral perspectives. Uh, but of course, none of these policies and strategies would mean a thing if they didn't have teeth to be implemented. And the teeth, in my opinion, always comes in the form of regulations. And so they, we do have obviously regulations that enable uh, you know, action on the ground, when we, whether we talk about the renewable energy law of 2012, the climate change bylaw of 2019, a waste management law as well that came out in 2020. <laughs> So uh, for those who, you know, say, OK, so what's the Jordan been doing on the ground? You know, I think we have a lot of uh, interesting uh, success stories that we should shed light on. We should scale within Jordan and Jordan can be used as a launch pad to scale this technology and experience to other countries in the region, particularly those that are trying to rebuild. Uh, you know, we look around us, you know, Syria, Iraq, Yemen, Palestine um, are all in the process of rebuilding and, and Jordanian uh, expertise, you know, Jordanian stability can serve as a hub to really uh, extend this kind of assistance. And of course, at the same time, this helps Jordan address some of its own economic um, difficulties, right? Jordan is, is really seeks to increase its uh, economic diversification as well and create jobs. So these kinds of projects, if scaled locally and regionally, can also help Jordan's economic situation. So, you know, I just share a few examples here. Uh, the summer wastewater treatment plant is one of the most energy efficient treatment plants uh, in the region. And, you know, it's almost entirely self-sufficient when it comes to energy. Uh, it uses gas from the process. It uses a difference in head to generate some kind of hydro energy uh, and also employs renewable energy. So that's a wonderful case study. And of course, wastewater coming out of it is almost entirely being reused for agriculture. So it's in a way an, an example of a water energy food nexus project in the region. Uh, Jordan has already implemented wind farms. Uh, you know, photovoltaics have taken, um, you know, taken on both at the decentralized scale. So you see these projects of, you know, mosques and houses of worship, uh, churches in Jordan, homes, schools, hospitals, um, and of course on the, on the centralized level. So part of the energy mix, uh, Jordan set out to achieve 10% renewables by 2020. That target was achieved. And now that target is being raised to 14% by 2030. Um, you know, there's a waste to energy plant uh, in Amman. Uh, there's ecotourism projects popping up. We know how important tourism is important to Jordan. But now Jordan is trying to differentiate that ecotourism can really be uh, an, a new driver of, of demand. Um, you know, Jordan has its uh, first Miyawaki native forest. There's a you know, wonderful group of volunteers that go around collecting native seeds from Jordan and establishing these almost uh, self-sufficient forests uh, that after a year or two don't require much uh, watering or support. Uh, you know, public transport is a key pain point. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And uh, these wetlands, you know, this is a, a technology, a very simple technology, zero energy, uh, uses, uh, you know, biological treatment of wastewater and can really take up a takeoff actually in rural areas in Jordan. So this is just some of the examples of what's happening on the ground. 
Um, and some of the things that I personally have been working on over the last year is really to try and bridge the climate and environmental uh, policy agenda with the planning and fiscal policy agenda. So, um, you know, the latest uh, indicative executive program, which really shows what the government's priorities are for the next two years, had a green economy pillar, which is wonderful. This is issued by the Ministry of Planning, not the Ministry of Environment, and also focused on economic reform, which Manal highlighted as a really important uh, priority. Um, so because of that, you know, I had the pleasure to work on mainstreaming climate change into our key economic reforms. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that in the next slide. Uh, I was also involved in the green recovery plan for Jordan that we looked at, you know, the four key sectors impacted by COVID and how can we uh, think about rebuilding these sectors from a green recovery perspective. In addition, uh, you know, when we look at our public expenditure, our financial system in Jordan, you know, how can we, where, where are the strengths, where are our weaknesses when it comes to integrating climate? This assessment right now is, is, is uh, almost final and will come out soon. It's one of the first uh, done in the world. So again, these are the kind of firsts that Jordan can uh, transfer to other countries in the region. Uh, and similar to this, uh, an expenditure and institutional review is really looking at not just the Ministry of Environment's ability to push the climate agenda, but also ministries of finance, ministries of planning and other sectors. An important project I wanna highlight here is also a 750 million project between the World Bank and Jordan, uh, which looks at really inclusive climate responsive investment, again, from a recovery lens. Uh, and a lot of exciting developments are happening under that project, uh, because it really is trying to support Jordan in, uh, in its entire pipeline of project development. How do you capture climate uh, responsiveness at the very beginning of concept note development, whether you're a project in the public sector or in the private sector? And how can we really have a robust climate finance governance framework in the country? So when I mentioned linking climate to economic reforms, if you open our five-year reform matrix, you look at all these very, you know, uh, typically economic reforms that you think about, right? Macroeconomic adjustments. So we're trying to link our tax policy to our NDC commitments. When we look at the public sector spending more efficiently, and you know, we're looking at green procurement because the public sector directs a lot of money into infrastructure and retrofits. So how can these be green? Uh, when we look at FDI and, and exports as well, um, you know, looking at, uh, you know, Jordan perhaps becoming a climate change center of excellence on green investment. Uh, in any day now, we're going to be issuing green bond guidelines. That's, uh, you know, an invitation as well to the private sector. Um, and so on, these are, you know, just some, some examples, just to suffice to say that what we're talking about is that Jordan needs jobs, investments, and exports, uh, and they might as well be green because of all these other environmental co-benefits, but also the ability to access environmental finance. Uh, this is the latest economic monitor by the World Bank that just came out, and you can see how Jordan and countries of the region's GDP was hit. Uh, Jordan actually, you know, is, has probably the worst unemployment rate right now. And so in this report, I'm just taking transport as an example, the, uh, there's a very strong link being made Made to you know these economic shocks that we face from COVID, how do we come out of them through a green uh, economic recovery approach? So as an example here, they took the you know the BRT project, the bus rapid transit, you know this shift to public transport, and you know the co-benefits that this can have on decarbonization, on uh, you know inclusive modes of transport that can help women and people with disabilities get jobs um, and help to attract uh, or help to you know adapt the transport sector to climate change. So one quick example. So my takeaways, thank you so much for holding on this long, um, is that we need to prioritize investments in adaptation uh, and not just mitigation. Uh, and, and when we talk about investments, we're not just talking about, you know, we have to mobilize public, private, and the development financing. All three sources of financing need to be directed in that direction. Uh, governments have to strengthen their policy and regulatory frameworks, but also need to enforce them. I think that's where we still need to do a little bit more on the enforcement side. Uh, we need to leverage the outcomes of COP26, you know, Article 6, carbon markets, uh, uh, the adaptation financing that's being promised and tapping into those hundreds of billions of dollars that uh, are being promised by 2025. Uh, again, the private sector communicates for Jordan to communicate and market for countries of the region to say to the investment community in the world that we have pipelines of projects that are ready for investment, be it in hydrogen, in energy, in waste or agriculture. Uh, donors and IFP
CFIs, they, they are active players in our development. You know, how can they tailor their portfolios, I'm sorry, in Jordan and the region towards climate action? And of course, the role of NGOs and civil society in local projects, raising awareness and keeping government accountable. So in closing, you know, I think we can turn this uh, next big challenge for the region, hopefully into the next big development opportunity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shada, and thank you very much, Glader and Manal. Um, we, uh, we don't have a great deal of time left. We'll probably overrun a, a little bit, if that's okay with our speakers. Um, but we have some great questions. Um, I'm going to, uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I'm going to read them out to, to our speakers for the sake of time. And the first one from uh, Roger Higginson is, is very much about, uh, you know, do we have any evidence that politicians and governments in the region are really waking up to the, to, to, to the challenges here? Um, you know, is that sufficient? I think we heard a little bit upon that. And then moving on to Kate Nevins's question, which is a, a little bit really, um, it, it's, she's interested in how local communities in MENA are seeing climate through inequality and justice lens? And do you have any examples of civil society groups, activities and activism on this, uh, particularly in some of the places with the least resilient, resilience to climate breakdown like Yemen? So uh, at one point, one point here, we have one question about what governments are doing, authority figures, but also then what grassroots are doing. And I'm just gonna add one little, throw one in uh, uh, about how are we seeing co enough cooperation between these governments, authorities, and indeed at a civil society level across the region? Now, who, who'd like to go first uh, First on that? Uh, Glader, go for it. Thanks, Chris. Um, I feel that the first question has been answered uh, by Manal and Shadda to some extent. Uh, Certainly, I think governments are taking this more seriously, although that comes as a variety, for a variety of reasons. As, as Manal said, you know, and, and Shada said, some can be economic, some can be development related, some can be um, uh, for political reasons, but certainly with the severity of the projections, um, there's, there's, no chance, there's, there's no place to hide. I mean, I think there have, the, uh, the realities of, of climate change and environmental degradation have to be on the agenda in some way. Of course, you can, you know, you can argue the extent to which um, uh, uh, serious efforts are put into integrating policies to address the environment. There are often quite conflictual practices, um, which come down to a, a range of uh, uh, long, long standing governance uh, deficits um, in certain countries. But uh, yeah, I think Shada gave a great example of how these priorities can really can really join up with, with development goals. Um, on the second question from Kate, I thought this was a really fascinating question and it's something that I'd be interested to, to know more about in Yemen. Kate, you're the expert on that. Uh, but I did want to draw attention to the organizations who work on uh, environmental justice in, um, in, the, in the Palestinian territories. I think there's, and, and in Israel, I mean, I think there's an interesting um, group of organizations, uh, for instance, the Man Development Center in Ramallah, which focuses on development in Palestine, but therefore focuses on water and agriculture and youth employment, and therefore will come head on um, uh, in, in uh, with with the um, with the problems with uh, land confiscation, uh, you know, uh, destruction of properties and wells and systems and all the issues related to ability to adapt and be resilient to climate change. And so they've put out some interesting reports on on environmental uh, damage due to occupation. There's Al Haq, which is a, a lawyers' association, um, which is has uh, taken cases uh, forward against the Israeli government on waste disposal, for instance, illegal waste disposal in, in the West Bank, but then has yeah uh, come into uh, come into that environmental arena that way. Um, and there's a new organisation called One Climate, which is um, combined of both Israelis and Palestinians, um, which uh, which I mean the environmental movement in the region generally has been rather hamstrung by politics um, in terms of cooperation. It's an extremely sensitive 
um, it's become a more and more sensitive issue to work on, um, even though, even in spite of the, the shared resources between the three countries. Um, yeah, this, the, the new organization I mentioned attempts to look both uh, at uh, the occupation and uh, inequalities and injustices there alongside the need for um, attention to environment and climate change. So that's interesting. Um, and I would say like generally in the region, uh, human, I mean, um, environmental civil society organisations are quite few in number, but environment, you know, maybe pursued through through social and other civil society projects. But it and it, it tends to be, um, you know, there's there's a wide range of, of laws governing this, and there's a really good report by the International Centre for Non Not for Profit Law that looked, assessed um, civil society on climate change across uh, several countries, but not Yemen, unfortunately. Um, and it showed the variety and the laws that govern these issues, but they tend to be, um, environmentalist activities tend to be tolerated unless they come, unless they, they, they directly criticize the government or the royal family or, um, you know, uh, get involved in corruption and human rights issues. Um, and maybe I can just say a word on, on the other question about um, holding the COP in, in Sharm in Egypt. Um, there has been intense criticism of this from Human, right, Human Rights Watch, which draw attention to the, uh, to the narrowing space for civil society in Egypt and the fact that you know, many civil society activists have been, been jailed and um, that they've essentially, you know, the government's essentially criminalised um, uh, protest and and, uh, and peaceful assembly, you know, without without approval. So this does pose a problem for posing a COP, at which uh, you know the the, the, the principle of, of the UNFCCC process is definitely to be inclusive of civil society and to allow protests to happen. So it will be uh, it will be something to watch. I think as that pans out. Thank you, Gleda. Do do Manal or Shada have anything to add on those questions? I would, Chris. Oh, yeah. um, uh, particularly to the question on uh, the first one, on whether the governments are waking up to this. And as Gleda had mentioned, I've already, and Shada as well, had talked a bit about it at the beginning. Uh, but as I mentioned, um, I think the driver has really been more from what can we do to incorporate these projects more from an economic uh, perspective to kind of catch um, uh, uh, really more of the, 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 in, the largening share or the increasing share of none uh, oil uh, uh, exports, can we take part of that? So I think that's been really the driver and it really hasn't been so much, I think, uh, the, the environment. There's a lot more uh, progress now than five years ago when it comes to whether it's nature-based solutions like planting trees uh, or even uh, looking at, for example, um, uh, uh, even the, the 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 corals and the biodiversity of the oceans and things like that. But still, I think these are really not the main driver. We have, for example, I mentioned one of the main uh, problem with emissions is transport. Uh, uh, public transport uh, uh, systems and, and infrastructure are also still kind of weak in, in that regard as well. So there's, um, I think, even though there's a lot of progress, um, which we shouldn't uh, say that it, it's, it's not visible and not clear, but I think it has not been in the, the environment as a target and the climate, saving the climate and reducing pollutions and all uh, really the, the, the different elements of the climate that are being affected have not really been featured as the priority. And also it's, we, we need to also not forget that they are linked. So for example, uh, Shada mentioned uh, ecotourism and uh, all the Gulf states, Egypt, for example, also all depend on tourism. Uh, but all of that tourism uh, base is also going to be re relies on environmental resources and all of that will be negatively impacted if we don't really take the environment and effects on the environment seriously but the link between those for example isn't really very clear and visible neither in government announcements nor in the action uh, policies on the ground um so that will be kind of uh, my take on, on that and also maybe one last point on that is um, I also think this might be slightly related to the civil society point, but I think the education across the region on what uh, what even individually people can do, let alone governments, I think there's a huge scope for improvement there as well for people to know that 
you know, the, the air that we breathe belongs to all of us. Uh, the water that we uh, uh, use and, and produce or will swim in or the fish that we eat and all of that is also belonging to all of us. What does that mean for agriculture? So I think that is also a scope where the government and potentially civil societies can also work on is this massive cultural educational uh, um, improvement, so to speak, um, across uh, not just oil exporters, but also oil importer economies. I think we could do more of that everywhere, including uh, Britain and, and the rest of Europe as well. Um, we've got a question from Bruce Stanley, which is a, a, an interesting one, and it's really about the impact of what the US and UK militaries have uh, done and left behind in the region over the years. And of course, I suppose, most particularly, you know, in Iraq, uh, toxic waste dumps. Um, of course, we've seen more recently that the, the bombings of uh, Libya, Syria as well. Anybody want to have a quick go at that question? Glader. Uh, yes, I'll say a few things. I can't really um, answer the question on what they are doing. Um, uh, I'm, just, I'm just trying to see, that, oh yes, how might the accounting game address? Um, but certainly, and this is a massive issue, I mean, the impact of military action across the region is intense. Um, there's some amazing work that's been done by Wim Zeinberg with PAX um, using satellite imagery and other open source data to look at destruction, for instance, of water facilities, of um, artisanal oil refineries, um, of, of oil spills across the um, northern Syria and, and, um, uh, and northern Iraq region. Um, it's 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 horrific and of course those kind of impacts then double or treble whatever the the, the other impacts of, of drought and etc that, that farms are facing because of the toxicity to water and soil um yeah just in, in terms of the the u.s military it's interesting that you know dust and sandstorms are becoming more intense in the region especially with the shamal winds in iraq and um and they are massively exacerbated by the military activity that took place in the early 2000s um, because of the, you know, the tanks rolling over territory, kicking up a lot of, a lot of dust, um, as, as well as destruction that's happened since then. Um, there is a movement at the Geneva level to look at... Um, essentially, you know, environmental destruction or ecocide as a, as a war crime. Um, it's, it's, it's a very controversial issue, but it's, it's being pushed by a number of actors. Um, and the more we look at it, you know, the more un, untenable the position is to, to pursue <laughs> a conflict in, in any way that damages what little natural resources countries will have to enable them to actually rebuild um, and restore peace. Thank you, Glader. I mean, I think it's, uh, you know, very yeah. difficult to imagine really um, constructive and positive, effective uh, uh, policies if conflict continues to unfortunately um, hit the Middle East in so many areas. And of course, conflict-ridden societies, people are going to find it difficult to prioritise climate change when they're basically struggling to, to survive. And we had a comment there from Angela Godfrey Goldstein um, regarding the Israeli military and its its role in uh, environmental destruction. And of course, um, I'm sure we'll have time to come on to that in future events, but certainly. Um, Shada, there is a question for you about uh, civil society activity in, in Jordan. Um, uh, can you give us some examples? A question from Dima. Yes, um, thank you so much, Chris. Um, thanks, Dima, for your question. Um, I can say, to be honest, that I've, I'm very heartened to see uh, a growing role uh, of civil society in Jordan uh, in tackling environmental and climate issues. Um, for example, uh, you know, we've got the uh, Jordan Renewable Energy Energy Efficiency Fund. Uh, it was distributing, uh, you know, solar water heaters, PV systems through community-based organizations uh, and, you know, building capacity of actually, they were even looking at, you know, men 
men and women in those you know villages to play a role in uh, operation and maintenance of these systems. Um, when I was the director of the Environment Fund, uh, we also gave grants to NGOs uh, to do waste recycling programs. And we've really come to find that um, a lot of the issues at the local level cannot be tackled by the central government sitting in Amman. Um, so it really is within the government's best interest to uh, divert funding to local organizations. Uh, and there is a move towards decentralization in Jordan, Chris, with trying to direct funding to municipalities, to governorates, giving them more autonomy in managing them. Uh, there are growing, or what do you say, uh, growing pains in that, you know, uh, but at least Jordan is on that path. Uh, and I, I'm happy to see more funding being directed that can be picked up by NGOs and CSOs. So that's just a few examples. But on your second part, Zima, uh, there is definitely efforts to update the curricula in Jordan to embed climate change and environmental concepts in primary year uh, education curricula. That's a joint project worked on by the Ministry of Environment and UNDP. Uh, so I myself am also very excited about that, that you know, we really need to start at that young age to shift the relationship between students and their environment. And what I love about that is that you know, there is a call for more interactive you know, it's not just reading the books, but actually having a garden in your school and planting and really growing that connection with nature from a young age. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we've run a little bit over time, so I think I'm going to call proceedings to, to an end now. But just to thank everybody for coming today uh, for your questions. And in particular, of course, to our three speakers, Gladilan, Manal Shahabi, and Shadar Al Sharif. It's been truly fascinating to, to listen to you. Yes, it, it is overall rather you know, gloomy with some positive examples, but I think that there is this massive opportunity to now to, to build on COP26 and to really um, trigger some action in the region at a government and a local level, uh, public education, uh, to try to help things. As indeed, you know, I'm extremely humble about our own activities in Europe. And after all, uh, it is the advanced economies, the industrialized economies like Britain, uh, you know, have so much a role in, in, in pushing climate change originally. So we have a, a responsibility. So thank you, everyone. Um, I do hope that you all uh, get a, a, a break over Christmas and New Year and you have a very happy one and uh, so forth. Please do stay safe. And we look forward to seeing you in the new year. And we will certainly be doing more on uh, this vital topic of climate change and, and environment in the region. Um, so thank you all once again. And uh, 